The topic of secondary immune deficiencies is also an interesting one. Um, remember, this is when I have a deficiency of the immune system that's not caused by some genetic abnormality or defect or mutation, but rather because of usually some sort of an environmental uh, factor. So I'll give you some examples of factors that can cause secondary immune diseases. Things like malnutrition uh, can do it. For example, in people um, who have very severe malnutrition, zinc is a really critical uh, coenzyme for uh, T and B cell production. So if a person is uh, chronically depleted in zinc stores, their ability to manufacture B and T cells is going to be uh, compromised. Stress can do it. You'll remember that with stress comes the release of uh, glucocorticoids. And glucocorticoids, you'll remember from 202, have the ability to suppress the immune system because they fall in that category of steroids we talked about before. Thus, they are um, able to suppress those phospholipases that normally give rise to arachidonic acid. Um, they do a few other things, too. Um, Cancer can do can also produce a secondary immune deficiency. For example, Hodgkin and non-Hodgkin lymphomas deplete the total count of lymphocytes in the body. So it should make sense that that would be a secondary source of uh, immune deficiency or immune disease. And then there are a number of um, infections that I'm going to be talking about in a minute, particularly AIDS. HIV infection that can impact things. And there's also what are called iatrogenic causes. This means medically generated or doctor caused or however you want to say it. So sometimes anesthesia and surgery can generate a B and T cell deficiency. Um, if the doctor in intentionally suppresses bone marrow cells as part of a treatment program for somebody, that's going to cause a deficiency. Uh, removing somebody's spleen, having a splenectomy is going to cause a deficiency. But what I want to spend our time focusing on in this part of the lecture is just one example of a secondary um, uh, type of immune disease. And I'm going to focus on how HIV infection depletes the immune system. So uh, HIV is the causative agent of a condition called AIDS, or Acquired Immunodeficiency Syndrome, which you all probably know already. Uh, so etiology is the HIV virus. Here's a picture of that HIV virus. It's Even though it's a relatively simple little critter, it has a whole lot of different proteins and enzymes and RNA and uh, has an envelope on its surface that's made from uh, the uh, host. And it, Well, we'll get into that in a minute. Um, now, the epidemiology of, immuno, of um, HIV is that it's a uh, very easily transmitted uh, virus. The most common route by which it tends to be transmitted is sexual contact. Um, most people readily think, oh, it must be homosexual contact. But worldwide, uh, the most common means of, con of transmission sexually is heterosexual. And even in the United States, where initially HIV was uh, pr principally transmitted by homosexual contact, heterosexual contact is now the more common mode of transmission. So even in the United States, it's switched to heterosexual contact. Um, it can also be transported uh, via blood. So if somebody has a blood transfusion or they share a needle, a, a drug user shares a needle with a friend, uh, that can transmit it. Um, there's, a, oh, and that I should tell you, when you have that kind of a transfer, either through the blood or through, uh, by injecting into the blood or into tissues, that's called parenteral transmission. And then the final category is mother to infant transmission. It is possible for an HIV um, positive mother to pass the HIV onto the uh, developing fetus. So the overall structure of HIV um, is fairly complex. Your book goes into quite a bit of detail. I'm not going to go into as much detail as your book, but I do want to point out a couple key points. Um, there are two main types of HIV, or two main families, if you will, of HIV, called HIV-1 and HIV-2. They are, uh, as like all HIV, they are members of a lentivirus family, which means they're a retrovirus. You'll remember from Bio 205, that means that they inject RNA into their host and then use reverse transcriptase to uh, manufacture DNA that is inserted into the host genome. Now, um, among the two main families of HIV, one and two, 
HIV-1 is a more common type that we see in places like the United States, Europe, and Central Africa, uh, whereas HIV-2 tends to be the predominant type seen in uh, Western Africa. The structure of the HIV is that it has a lipid envelope on its surface, and that's composed of the plasma membrane of the host. Remember when viruses erupt from the host cell, one of the last things they do is they encase themselves with plasma membrane from the host cell. That's what you see here. And there are, of course, some antigenic determinants or some different types of glycoproteins found on the surface of this, uh, including things like uh, GP120 that I'll talk about later. Now, interior to that, um, there's also going to be a bunch of RNA. In fact, there's two copies in the virus core. And in the virus core, there's something else that's important I want to point out, and that is something called a capsid protein P24. Capsid protein P24. The reason I point this one out specifically is because when uh, people are tested for HIV, this is the principal protein they're trying to detect in the patient's serum. Uh, there's other things that are found in the viral core, like the reverse transcriptase and other viral enzymes. There are some nucleocapsid proteins we're not going to worry about. Um, one thing that's very important for you to know if you don't already about HIV is that it has an astoundingly high mutation rate. If we look at norm, a, a, a normal healthy human being and we look at the rate of mutation during a mitotic division of a cell, the typical rate of division, uh, I'm sorry, of mutation um, in a human is about one in a billion. So one mutation for every billion, with a B, billion, nucleotides that are copied. Now you have about 3 billion nucleotides in your entire genome, so you're looking at roughly approximately 3 uh, randomly generated mutations every time a cell undergoes mitosis. Not a super big deal considering that 98% of DNA is uh, non-genetic material, but um, anyway, if we look at HIV virus, the mutation rate is one mutation for every 10,000 nucleotides. That's a huge rate. Huge, huge, huge. That means that, that that HIV virus is a moving target for scientists. And this explains um, why it's been so very difficult for scientists to develop any kind of an affected, uh, effective virus, uh, sorry, effective vaccine against the HIV virus. Um, it just changes so quickly every time they develop a, a vaccine for a particular antigenic component, that antigenic component changes. And so now they've got to redevelop another one. So that high mutation rate makes it extremely hard to treat uh, HIV infection. Now if we look at the, within the HIV-1 group, there, um, or family, there is a bunch of subtypes within that group. These are called clades. Um, and uh, the, there's the M or, uh, oh, what's it called? O is for outlier, M is for not mainstream, I'm blanking out. Nothing like a quick trip to the textbook to remind myself. M is for major. So this is the big group, and it has a bunch of different um, subtypes within it. Uh, that are go through A through J, and you don't need to worry about that. But uh, the major group is the most common one. The outlier group is a less common uh, version. Um, that's all we. That's what we know based on molecular analysis of the HIV worldwide. So what? Why do you care about knowing that? Only because of this. If we look, for example, at the subtypes in the M or major group, what we find is particular subtypes tend to be transmitted more readily along one particular transmission path. So, for example, your book gives um, the example that uh, type, the the B type is the most common form in Western Europe. E type is most common in Thailand. E type tends to predominantly spread by heterosexual contact, but B type, B as in boy, um, is usually transmitted by monocytes and lymphocytes. So there's different pathways of transmission among these different groups. So that can have um, an impact on treatment regimens if we know which subtype a patient might have. So the pathogenesis of HIV is, is similar to other viruses, just um, uh, in the, the general life uh, cycle of a virus, which you learned about in Bio 205. 
The main targets of HIV virus are the immune system and to a lesser degree, the central nervous system. And I'm really not going to go into talking about the central nervous system except to say that some individuals with HIV get central nervous system involvement that can include things like meningitis and even dementia. And that's enough on that. What I want to focus more on is how uh, HIV impacts the immune system because this is its major thrust for how it it causes so much damage in the body. So here's my uh, HIV virus. And of course, it has all these antigenic determinants on its surface, including one called GP120, which I'll talk about in just a second. And it turns out HIV is, has a, a very strong affinity or a very strong preference for attachment to CD4 protein. And we know that CD4 protein is found on a certain type of T cell. What you might not know is CD4 is also found on things like dendritic cells and macrophages. And I'll have more to say about that later. Um, so here's this virus. It's going to initially attach to this CD4 protein on the cytoplasmic surface. Here you can see that it's attaching, and it's attaching at that GP120 protein on the surface of the virus. So the GP120 attaches to the CD4. But we're not done yet. We have to have one more anchoring event occur. And that is um, further binding of that GP120 to this protein right here, which is called CCR5 protein. The only reason I mention this is because, interestingly, there is a subset of people in the United States who are defective from making the CCR5 receptor protein. They can't make this protein. And as a result, you can infect them all day long with HIV, and they will not develop infection. HIV has, does not have the ability to enter into a host cell and take over the cell. So once we've got this docking occur, of course, then the, the uh, virus will inject its, um, its uh, little capsule containing RNA and all of those reverse transcriptase, et cetera, and start to take over the cell and command it to make copies of HIV virus. Now, once that occurs, um, once I have exposure to the HIV virus, there's a progression of the disease, and it starts out with an acute infection and, and then proceeds to chronic. In the acute infection state, um, this involves principally memory CD4 cells. Mostly they're found in mucosal lymphoid tissues. Um, by the way, you should probably know that mucosal tissues are the number one site for T lymphocytes, um, so it should make sense that uh, the place where we're seeing infection starting to fulminate is in lymphoid mucosal tissues and lymphoid tissues. So when a person becomes infected, here they are, we get exposure. Uh, some of the CD4 cells start to get infected in places like lymph nodes. And we go through, um, for a period of time, maybe for a couple weeks, um, a, an increase in the number of viral particles present in the blood because of the spread of the virus. And this is called viremia, when I have virus present in the blood. And that viremia goes pretty high. Uh, a lot of times people will get flu-like symptoms um, associated with initial, uh, with acute uh, HIV infection. And then over time, um, once the HIV virus has spread itself throughout the body and is in a number of CD4 cells, uh, as well as some dendritic in cells and macrophages, it kind of goes into a uh, sort of a dormant phase. It's called clinical latency. Clinical latency. And that's where uh, the HIV virus lingers inside of CD4 cells, but it's not active. It's not actively forcing those CD4 cells to replicate uh, virus. What does initiate um, the replication usually is some sort of um, uh, infection. You know, somebody, they get an infection for something else, and then that kind of sets off. Um, a problem with the total amount of, of uh, CD4 cells that are getting damaged. Um, now, when you're in the chronic phase, an individual in chronic phase is still able to handle most opportunistic infections. And that's uh, principally because 
when you look at the overall count of CD4 cells that are actually infected with HIV in a person with chronic infection, it's only about 0.1% of the CD4 cells that are infected. Um, that seems like a tiny little bit, but over years, that number climbs. Okay, it definitely climbs. Now let me show you the ways in which a CD4 cell can be uh, um, damaged, destroyed due to HIV infection. There are three principal routes. One is direct destruction. That's where the virus itself infects the CD4 cell, takes over uh, the nucleus of the CD4 cell and commands it to start replicating C um, HIV virus and releasing it. And when the infected cell releases it, of course, it dies. That's route one, direct destruction. Route two involves that GP120 protein I mentioned before. You remember that? Go back here. The GP120 protein was one of the proteins that helped in docking. Well, interestingly, in um, infected CD4 cells, they can actually, um, I'm sorry, let me back up and say that again. Viral particles can actually go to uninfected CD4 cells. And simply by having their GP120 protein come in contact with those normal, uninfected helper T cells can cause them to undergo apoptosis. So even though they were normal and healthy, they're not allowed to persist uh, thanks to an interaction with this GP120. Now, GP120 doesn't just have to be present on the virus, by the way. Lots of free-floating GP120 will start to accumulate in the blood plasma of patients with HIV. So you can imagine you've got all this free-floating GP120 and it's just knocking into helper T cells and causing them to undergo apoptosis. That's a huge uh, way to deplete CD4 populations. Last one is that, of course, if I have an infected CD4 cell, obviously an HIV-sensitive um, CD8 cell that's primed to attack any cell infected with HIV is going to identify that cell is infected and make it undergo apoptosis. So three different routes by which I can kill off CD4 cells. And I put a note up here to remind you that um, CD4 cells, T lymphocytes, are not the only ones that have CD4 on their surface. Macrophages and dendritic cells do as well, and they tend to serve as a very sneaky reservoir of, of uh, HIV virus. They then themselves, for some reason, do not tend to get infected with the HIV, but rather what happens is uh, the HIV virus kind of attaches to the surface of the macrophages and dendritic cells, and it just kind of hangs out there and uh, can harbor copies of the virus that later can be released and uh, reestablish a, a fulminant infection. So how does it look when we see the progression of the symptoms of HIV, and how does it lead to acquired immunodeficiency syndrome, which is this depletion of the immune system that we said was an example of secondary immune disease. Well, let's take a look at it here. Obviously, because CD4 cells are the primary targets for the for HIV virus, and you remember that CD4 cells are critical to stimulating the antibody-mediated uh, antibody response and the cell-mediated response, once my CD4 cell population is depleted, my ability to stimulate a B or T cell response is also gone. And at that point, I become very susceptible to opportunistic infection that leads to death. So here we have that acute phase I talked about before. If you look, when we have primary infection, a person has a lot of, of helper T cells around, normal healthy level of helper T cells. Notice how that drops within the first few weeks of infection. And at the same time, in yellow here, the total number of uh, HIV particles or virus particles uh, present in the patient climbs tremendously. That's that viremia. But then it drops off. The viremia drops way off. The helper T cells kind of start to rebound. And you could a, a patient can go on for years like this. This is that clinical latency phase where they really don't have symptoms, but progressively, a little bit, a little over time, over time, over time, they're getting a slow, uh, gradual uh, depletion of CD4 cells. And at some point, the CD4 cell populations start to drop to a critical level to the point where B and T cell uh, stimulation isn't happening the way it should. 
and opportunistic diseases start to occur. And that usually leads to death. And this is the, the part where we have uh, acquired immunodeficiency syndrome. When you get to the point where the person has secondary, I'm sorry, uh, opportunistic diseases, that's when you have acquired immunodeficiency syndrome. Your immune system is wiped out and suddenly you are susceptible to all kinds of fungal and bacterial infections that a healthy person would have no problem fighting off.